All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, give me a big thumbs up if you can hear me. <laughs> Got a couple. Good. <laughs> so, welcome to the to the final uh, final uh, session for today. Uh, this is a long workshop. Um, you guys have all heard the the standard spiel by now. Um, I just about got it memorized, so I didn't have to read it anymore. Um, this is a workshop, so it's going to be much more interactive. Um, it's uh, it's going to be an hour and a half. Uh, there's going to be some links for you to follow and some stuff that you can follow along. Um, we encourage your active participation and questions. So feel free to raise your hand and we'll bring you to the stage so that you can ask your questions directly. Uh, you can type into the Q&A and, uh, and uh, I'll be keeping an eye on that and making sure that our presenters are aware that there's questions. Um, and periodically we'll put a poll out to see if you guys are keeping track um, uh, or if you need some more time or, or, or extra, extra anything. So um, at any rate, please don't be shy uh, with, with any of your forms of communication, including emojis. So. With, uh, with that, um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce James McDonald from University of Washington, along with Lori Shepard, who's a part of the Bioconductor Core team. And uh, they're going to be uh, giving an introduction to Bioconductor Annotation Resources. So James, I'll turn the time over to you to take it away. Okay, thank you, Sean. So let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, this is the annotation workshop. Um, I'm, as Sean said, Jim McDonald and Laurie Shepard will be presenting the second half of this. Um, the, the basic idea for this is Bioconductor has a lot of different packages that are intended to help people annotate their data in an easier way than it would be to sort of go out to all the different annotation sources and get the data and try to, you know, collate it yourself by hand. Um, so this can be simple as doing something like if you have a bunch of ensemble IDs and then you wanted to say, well, what are all the gene symbols for this? That sort of thing is what we're talking about. Um, we'll be talking about the various different classes of packages that we have that can be used for doing this and basically how to use them more efficiently. So, the prereqs for this is we expect that you have a basic knowledge of R, um, a basic understanding of the annotation sources. Um, and for this is some useful back, uh, background reading, I would advise you to take advantage of the different vignettes because they tend to have a little bit more real world uh, use for, or more real world, world examples for how to do things than just what would you what you'd find in the help pages. So basically we're gonna go through all the different types of annotation packages and at the end of each sort of little chunk, we'll give you some uh, sort of examples that you can use to try to practice making your own queries and to see if you understand the material. So the packages we're gonna use, the first um, say five of these are all infrastructure packages that are meant to have functions that allow you to inter interact with the underlying data packages. And so the rest of these, this from org.hs.eg.db all the way down, these are all different examples of annotation packages that um, don't have much functionality in them, they just contain the data. Um, so annotation, annotating data can be sort of a complex task. Normally, when you're doing some sort of an experiment, a high throughput experiment, usually what you have to start with are some sort of IDs that are meant to be identifiable. In other words, they're supposed to be unique for everything that you're measuring, but they're not necessarily useful. So something like an ensemble ID, gene ID, or a NCBI gene ID, they're identifiable in as much as they're unique to that gene, but by themselves, they don't really mean anything. And so oftentimes what you have to do is take these IDs that came with your data and map them to things that a biologist or a, or a collaborator might understand, like a gene symbol or something like that. Um, so the goals that we hope you can come away with are understanding all the annotation data that the Bioconductor project makes available to you, um, understand a little bit of the difference between the two main annotation sources. So 
some of the data we get from NCBI and some of what we get from Ensemble. And um, there's actually quite a few differences between those, even though the idea is to basically describe the same exact thing. There's different ways of sort of getting through it and to, different ways of describing the data. And so you end up with these sort of mismatches in what people agree and don't agree on. Um, we want you to be able to gain familiarity with uh, the various ways to use these packages and hopefully get some practice using them. So the objectives are these four things. We want you to be able to use the different functions to extract data from these different annotation packages, and we'll go through them one by one. So what do we mean by annotation? Um, as I alluded to earlier, oftentimes when you are doing sort of a high throughput experiment, you have this identifiable ID that is not very useful in and of itself. So you can do functional annotation where you've got this ID and you might want to map it to like a gene symbol or a gene ID, which is this sort of one-to-one -one mapping where you say, this ID is this gene and it's there's just one gene for that ID. Or you may want to be doing some sort of group mapping where you want to take all, uh, all the IDs and map them to something like a go term or a keg pathway so you can group a set of genes into sort of a functional group of genes that are, that are thought to work together in, in an organism. There's also positional annotation where you can do the same thing with the ID where you're mapping that ID to like the chromosomal position or getting the sequence for that, um, for the underlying position or find the CDS, the coding sequence, uh, map it to the CPG sites. So this is basically taking the ID and saying, where in the genome does it live, really is what it boils down to. And these mappings can also do, you can do this mapping from like transcript ID to gene ID. So we can do this sort of um, like around the horn, you go from transcript ID to gene ID or gene ID to gene name. So you can do multiple sorts of mapping with these, pro with these um, packages. So in general, the goal is, as I said, you start out and you've got this sort of data matrix. This is on the left here and on the right here, it's supposed to be the uh, your, your data. It's this rectangular set of numbers where the columns are your samples and the rows are usually genes or maybe they're metabolites. And oftentimes you will take those data and you'll make some comparisons and you'll make some statistics where you've got the statistics, the columns are the, the test you made and the rows are the statistics for each thing that you measured in the row. So they still line up, these rows line up. And then the farthest left here is the annotation where we've got each row is, is meant to line up again with the statistics and the underlying data to say, you know, this gene had this t-test and here's the underlying data, that sort of idea. And so you can do this just this way where you've got these three different um, data frames or matrices or whatever. And anytime you wanted to take a subset, it would be a problem because you'd have to, you know, carefully make these subsets so you didn't get things off where your annotations were shifted or something like that. So what Bioconductor does is we make available these data containers where you can encapsulate all of those data in one thing that acts just like a data frame, but it encapsulates all of the data. So instead of having these three things that we think of as being side to side, we would have this matrix on the top here, sort of where the columns here are information about the sample. In the, so if we look at this yellow thing here, the the column there would tell you information about that particular sample. And then in the experimental data would have all of the measurements for like each one of the genes. And then the row of this red thing would say what the gene is and then what all the values for all the different samples are. And the nice thing about this is you can take and you can subset that and it will automatically subset these underlying accessory data frames in such a way that you never get off. So you can, if you had like in your sample data, you've got half of them are say tumor and half of them are normal, you could basically subset that just to the tumor data and the, the sample data would still match up with the experimental data and the annotation data would as well. Um, so the, the basic first thing that we developed was a thing called an expression set and you can actually load an expression set. So I have a, 
an expression set that's part of this package. So if you load the BIOC 2021 anno package and then do this code string, which is a little bit um, artificial in as much as this file path system file business is just a way to be able to find the data that I provided in the package to use as an example. Normally you wouldn't do that. You would have it in your workspace and you would just sort of load it up or generate it. But we do this so we can get some example data. And if so, if you were to do that, you would, and then type ESET, it will tell you, it will spit out this in your um, R workspace that tells you stuff about that little expression set that I've provided. And basically it tells you these things. It's It's got, it tells you that there's 33,000 features, which is 33,000 genes. There's six samples. Um, you could have in the protocol data slot, you could say things about, you know, we took these samples and we did this with them, blah, 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 whatever you did as far as your experiment. The pheno, the pheno data tells you something about the samples. So this is that sort of block of data on the top where it tells you that all the things about the different samples. So it's got the sample names, um, a little data, it's a data frame. So it tells you what the row labels for this data frame are. And then it's got this thing where it tells you what like title and characteristics are. And then the feature data is that thing off to the left where it tells you all the things about each one of these genes. Um, and you can you can pull things out of this. So the this experts function will pull out the data. So you can see here's all the sample IDs. These are the, this is a FE gene ID data. So this is all the um, probe IDs. So this is the underlying data. This P data of the pheno data is the sort of sample information. So it tells you here's the six samples. Um, the title is this, this is geodata. So this is just sort of whatever the um, submitter called it. But the characteristics tell you that we've got three samples that were treated, treated with this one microRNA and the rest of them were treated with scramble. And so obviously the underlying experiment here is you want to compare the scramble and the, the microRNA data. Um, and then the feature data then tells you here's the probe ID and the entree gene ID and the gene name and things like that. Um, so the nice thing about these bioconductor structures like this um, expression set is you've got validity checking. So if you were to subset this, you can then ask R, is this still a valid thing? And it will either tell you, yeah, it's still good or it's not. Um, you can subset it as if it were just a data frame with the regular square bracket um, function that you're used to using for subsetting data frames. Um, and then there's also fun function dispatch on these. So as an example, if you had this, this data set that I showed and you wanted to use the Lima package to compare those two groups, you could just use this expression set thing directly into the Lima package and it will act just like it's a data frame. It will just grab out all the data you need and it will do all your statistics. And then it will automatically put in the top table, when you say, what's my most significant genes, it will automatically put all that annotation in there. So if you just say, what are my top 10 genes? It'll say, here's the pro ID, here's the gene ID, here's the gene name, here's the statistic, here's the p-value. And so everything is encapsulated. And when you're, when you're pulling things out, it's all just right there and everything lines up. And so you know that that t-statistic really lines up with that p-value and that um, gene name. The downside of these things is it's, you would never want to make one by hand. It's hard to extract the data by hand, but it's not really meant for that sort of thing. And it's only useful within R. You can't like take that and give it that to your collaborator. You actually have to extract the data to present it to somebody else. Um, but back to the main thrust of what we're doing is the type of annotation sources that we provide. So there's sort of different levels of these annotation um, packages that we provide. So the first layer is is sort of the lowest level, which is these chip DB, chip DB um, packages. And these are sort of a relic from the Affymetrics days when people were doing, you would you'd get an Affymetrics array or a Agilent array or whatever, and you would analyze that. And then you needed to be able to map the Agilent ID or the Affymetrics ID to sort of the gene ID or the symbol or whatever. The org DB is the next level up, and this is an organism level um, package that's meant to do, like in this case, this is the HS means homo sapiens. So this is 
all of the data where you can do mapping for functional um, annotations for the the humans humans. So you can take a gene ID and find what the gene symbol is or find where it is in the gene or things like that. This next level, this TXDB or ONSA or ENSDB, these are the positional that I talked about earlier, where you can map things from like the gene ID and you can say, well, where is it in the gene and what chromosome is it on? And um, what chromosome is it on? Where the chromosome, the, the actual position, you can get the um, the ORF, you can you can get the three prime UTR, you can get all that sort of information. The next level is this organism DB package, which is a meta package that encapsulates the org DB and the TXDB and then usually the GoDB. And this is just a it's like sort of a meta package that you can use to map things across these different, so you can get information from the org DB and the TXDB and Go out at once. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we also have BS genome packages, which is a way to extract the actual sequences. So you can get the sequence for any, any chunk of the um, genome using that. We have these um, other ones like GoDB, KigDBs actually shouldn't be here, that's been deprecated. But GoDB allows you to map gene IDs to the Go terms. And you can use that for doing things like uh, uh, gene ontology testing. And these last two, Annotation Hub and Biomart, are online resources that you have to have an internet, you have to have internet access to use, but they actually hold way more data than pretty much all of these combined. So <clears throat> when you interact with the annotation database packages, the main function you use is select. You, if you search online or on the support site, you may find other um, methods of querying, but you should probably not use those methods and you should use select instead. And the way it works is you just, it's just select. You give the name of the annotation package that you want to get things from. You put the keys that you want to get. So the keys are the IDs that you have. So if you have entry gene IDs or, um, Ensemble IDs, that's what would be here. Columns are the things that you want to get out. So keys are the things that you have. Columns are the things that you want to get. And key type is the thing where you can say, what kind of keys are these? So if they're entry gene IDs or ensemble IDs, then you can say, this is what it is for when it's doing the query. So as a sim simple example, we can use um, that thing that we already loaded up that ESET, and we can just extract just five of the of the FE probe IDs. That's these five things right here, and then we can query the underlying chip DB that I that provides information about that array, and say we just select use that ID. I mean the the annotation package. We want to get information from those IDs, and what we want is the symbol. And so if you if you run this function, it'll spit out this data frame. There's one really nice thing about this is it ends up, what it does is it guarantees the order of these. So we put in this probe ID first, this one second, this one third, this one fourth, this one fifth. And if you're going to annotate a sort of a, a, a rectangular set of data and you want those rows to match up, this ensures that if you put like the row names in of your data, then the annotation data you get back out matches up 100% with the row data that you put in. Um, so how do you know what the central key? Uh, one of the things I forgot to say is, right, yeah, so. I thought I had a, uh, one of the things, so what I forgot to say up here is, the key type, you don't actually have to specify the key type if the key you're using is the central ID of the package. So um, like in this case, I didn't say what kind of a key type it is. I just said, here's the package I want to query from, here's the IDs, and this is what I want. I didn't say these are probe IDs from this array. And I didn't have to do that because this, it's the what they call the central key for this um, annotation package. So how would you know what those central keys are? 
So if it's a chip DB like what we did before, it's the manufacturer probe IDs. Um, sometimes it's in the name. So like if it's the org.hs.eg.db, that EG stands for entree gene, which NCBI now calls the NCBI gene ID. And if that's what you're passing in to this particular package, you can just pass it in. You don't have to say that it's the entree gene ID. Um, you can guess it from looking at the, the head of the keys, or you can just always say what the key type is. So you don't have to be all fancy and just not put that in there. You can always put it in there and it will work for sure. So another question is, what can you get out of these things and how do you know what you can get out of it? So the first thing is, what kind of keys can I actually query on, right? So you might have Uniprot IDs or um, ProSide IDs or whatever. And you want to know, well, can I even use that? So if you use the key types function, it will spit out all the different key types that you can actually pass in. So for this particular package, you can query on any one of these um, keys. So we did probe ID, which is this one right here, but you could use RefSeq IDs, or you could go the symbols and get the probe IDs out. I mean, you can go any different way with this. And the columns function will tell you what things you can get out. So in other words, we could put in symbol and get out probe ID because the symbol is one key type and probe ID is one column type. So we could go the exact opposite to the way what we, what we did above. But there is one problem with select. Before you, before you go on, James, there's a, there's a question. Okay, um, go ahead. The uh, question is from, from Nicole Kramer. She says, uh, if select can't find a mapping for a key, will it just return NA to maintain the order? Yes, it will. Yep. Yeah, so there's two things that will happen. One, if let's say you've got 30 IDs that you're querying on, and one of those will actually return something, you'll get 29 NA values and then the one value. But if all 30 of those um, are not actually keys that are in that database. So all of these are an underlying database. So if those, if none of those IDs that you pass in there, it'll give you an error saying none of those keys are the key type. So it'll do this thing where if even one of them is in there, it'll spit out a bunch of NAs and then the one that matches. And if none of them are in there, it'll just say, yeah, that's, I can't even do anything with that. Does that make sense? Nicole, give a thumbs up. Yep, good. Yeah, this is kind of hard for me because I'm I'm looking at my screen that I'm sharing. I'm not looking at the air meet thing. <laughs> That's okay. That's where I'm here. <laughs> so there is one issue with select. And as I said just a minute ago, what we're doing is we're querying this underlying, underlying SQLite database. And the problem with these databases is you can have one-to-many matches. So we can do another query where we just use these three IDs and do the essentially the same query, except for now we want two things. We want the symbol and the map. And the map is basically the, I forget what the actual term for this is, but it's like when you have the karyotypes and you've got the P and the Q arm. So we can say, give me these three things and spit out the symbol and the map. Well, we end up getting nine things out. We gave it three, we got nine. And the problem with that is this, so this first ID has a one-to-one -one mapping for everything. That ID is the TRAF6 gene, and this is where it is. It's on 11P12. But this second ID actually maps to six different genes. So it maps to this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And then this one, it's it says it's mapping to it twice. The reason it says it's mapping to it twice is because that gene is in two places in the genome. So if you have any of these issues where you've got one-to-many mappings, and you ask for multiple things, you can end up having this thing just completely blow out where you end up, you say, well, I, I put in like 20 IDs that I wanted to map and I ended up getting like 300 rows back, um, depending on, on if you've got a lot of this multi-mapping thing. And so the way to get around that problem, and what, the, reason, the main reason that's a problem is if you're expecting this one-to-one -one concordance between the rows that you got back from select and the data that you put in, if you ask for too many things, you can end up blowing out those rows and then and then um, being off rows and thinking you're not. 
So one way of getting around that is this function called map IDs. And map IDs is, it's an alternative to select and it gives you control over these duplicates. So it works almost the same exact way as select. You put in the, the, the database that you're, or the package that you're querying on, the IDs, what you want back, but you could only ask for one thing at a time. Unlike select select, you could ask for like every single um, column in that database and you, you get it all back. With map IDs, you could only ask for one at a time and you always have to tell it what kind of a, um, a key type you're, you're asking for. So if we do the same thing with those three IDs that we had a problem with with select and just say, give me the symbols, it just gives us three symbols, right? Um, the issue with that, in as much as there's an issue, is we only got one gene ID for the second um, probe ID, but it was the very first one. So it just naively said, well, there's like six of them, but I'm only gonna give you the first one. Um, but you can control that. So we do have the choices for the multivalence argument and it's, we have a choice for what we can do with multiple mapping things using this multivalence argument. So um, you can use a list, char character list, filter as NA or first, which is the default. So we'll just go through those one by one. So if we do map IDs and we say list, then we get back what you would expect, which is a list. So now we've got one-to-one -one correspondence, but the second list item has got all six of the different genes that that particular probe ID maps to. Um, that's not super useful if you're still trying to do this thing where you wanna have each row matches up to the row of data in your, each, each row of your data, right? So a list doesn't really line up like that. It's not, it's not the same thing as like a data frame or a matrix. Um, you can tell, give me a character list back and it does this thing called a character list, which is meant to go into a data frame, but it's the capital D data frame, capital D, capital F, no period data frame. Um, if you're familiar with that and it's a character list, so then you can still have this one-to-one -one correspondence where each row matches up with um, all the data for that row. Um, you can use this function called filter what filter does is it says, if there's multi-mapping things, I'm just not gonna give it back to you. So we put in three IDs and we get back two. I'm not so sure how useful that is, but it's a thing that you can do. And the last one is as NA, and this does, anytime you've got a multi-mapping ID, what it does is it just gives back an NA. So this is actually how things used to work before we changed to using the select argument where back in the day, the default was if you had any of these multi-mapping things, it would just give you an NA, um, which is probably not as useful as knowing that this probe actually will measure, it's, you know, could probably measure six different things. Getting an NA is not as useful. Hey, hey James, we've got some more questions now. Okay. Um, so here's one. Um, how does one locate a data dictionary to explain what a key type for a column means? <laughs> well, um, that is the trick. Um, I let me see. And there's more parts to that question. So once you finish with this, I'll, I'll, I'll throw more at you. Really? Is that possible? The typos maybe? I don't think so. Um, that's a random. So this is just uh, any idea, Lori? Um. 
Not sure. You could try relaunching a new instance because I'm I'm on one of the ones launched and I have all those packages. So yeah. right. this is just really weird. Um, <laughs> um, uh, just just kill it and relaunch it. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you try doing a new one from the cancer? Um, can you see this? Can you see this Emacs window? You'd have to increase the font. But, oh. uh, let's, yeah, okay. So, what was your suggestion? Uh, if you launch a new one from the orchestra site. Just the this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you search in the top for annotation, it'll filter down. Yeah. And then you'll want to make sure. Oh, I think you just launched the one from last year. Oh, did I? Yeah. <laughs> if you go back, I think you want to double check that because I think you just launched the one from last year. Yeah, that's the right one. I get it. It's still here. Interesting. There we go. So remember I was telling you that there's old ways of sort of querying this. Um, there are these things called bimaps. And the way we used to do things is we use these things called bimaps. And so like this org.hs.eg symbol thing was the old way of doing things. And these for backwards compatibility, they still exist, but I would not recommend using them but you can get information about them because there's a help page for them. So that would probably be the way to do it. So like all these things, so like path and symbol and CHR and ensemble and ensemble trans, those are all the things. So if I just do, so all of these things, like, it, I, accession number, alias, ensemble, those are all here as appended on the end of this org.hs.eg. So like symbols here and accession number and everything like that. So the way you could figure it out is by using the help pages for those. So if you did, oh, then this will tell you. So it's it contains the mappings between entry gene identifiers and gen back accession numbers. And so like some of these are kind of a little bit more inscrutable, like IPI, so if we did, and it doesn't give me a help page. Oh, maybe that's not up there. Okay, so for the, the vast majority of them, that's what you would do. Um, Right. So this is map. A lot of these are self-explanatory, like ensemble protein, ensemble protein, um, PMID is PubMed IDs, ProSide is it's um, the uh, protein ProSite. So what's the other question? So the rest of that is: um, is there a guarantee that key types with the same name in different annotation packages? will always signify the same dimension. Will always signify the same dimension. So I think if you had a key type that was like symbol, 
from org.hs.eg, would that be the same thing as symbol from the Eugene 20 transcript cluster? Does does the key type symbol always mean gene symbol, for instance? Yes. So there are some times where that isn't true. And those times when it's not true, we'll get into with the TXDB and Ensemble DB packages, where there are some names that are not, they're not the same exact name in the two different packages. Um, but that's more to do with where the data come from. So like in TXDB, it's like gene ID and um, in the Ensemble DB, it'd be like entree ID or something like that. But in general, symbol is always symbol and Uniprot is always Uniprot. All right, does that, um, does that answer, answer the question, Andrew? Good. Are there, while we're paused, are there any other questions? You can raise your hand too and just come up on the stage. Imagining someone trying to like frantically type, wait, 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 I've got a question. Stop! My fingers won't do it. Okay, I'm not seeing any activity, so uh, I carry on. Okay, so this is the point at which we give you some things to try out. So here's four things to try out. So what gene symbol corresponds to Entree Gene ID 1000? And what's the gene ensemble gene ID for PPARG? And so on and so on. What's the unit ID for GAPDH? And how many probe sets in the expression set that we loaded map to a single gene? And please feel free to ask questions if you are having any problems with these questions. Maybe we can start working through the thought process of uh, answering some of them, just since it's normally a shorter time period than we're used to giving to. Okay. While they, uh, while they think about it, just you know, right. interested. So like, for example, we've got this gene symbol corresponding to Entree Gene ID. So if we think about that, we've got this org.hs.eg package. So one way you could envision doing that is you could do Um, select from that what we're trying to do. Yep, thousand. And what are we getting? Gene simple. So we want to select the I, the key we want to select is a thousand, right? And then we want to get the symbol. And I happen to know that. The entree gene ID is the central ID for this package, but we can actually just use it. We can just say entry ID. Right? So we have this package, we have a gene ID thousand, we want the symbol, and it's an entree gene ID. Um, one thing we can also do, so these these chip packages are also um, they actually are they're basically empty packages that just have one mapping and they just use the um, org package to do the thing. So we could actually do, um, load that. So we could also, do the same exact thing using that transcript package. Okay. 
and it'll just return the same thing. So the ensemble ID, so we can, so this, this question here is, how do you get the ID using a gene symbol? Right, so we've got our, the thing that we've got is this gene symbol. So so that's the thing that we've got. And what we want is, we want the ensemble ID and PR gamma is um, a gene symbol. So we're gonna put in Symbol. It tells us that it's that ensemble gene. Um, one nice thing that I should point out while we're here is sometimes you'll work with people that are sort of old school and they will tell you, um, I'm interested in gene whatever, and they give you some kind of, sort of a gene name. Sometimes those gene names are not current. So Maybe they're not using PPR gamma, they're using something else. Well, there is um, in the in the org.hs.eg.db this alias thing. So alias contains all of the gene symbols that have ever been appended to that particular gene going back in perpetuity. And I don't know if PPR gamma's got aliases, but we can look for that. Um, So these are all the things that people have called PPAR gamma in the past. So maybe you work with some old school person and they're like, yeah, I need to, I need to know about GLM-1. And you're like, if you query for that, if you say, Look at this. So you get an error because that's not a symbol. That's an alias that's been deprecated. So if you run into that sort of an issue, you can then query and say, um, do that, and then you can get the entree gene IDs that map to that alias. The one problem with this is all of the aliases also can all of the current gene symbols. <laughs> so you'd want to like check that and go back and map what these two entry gene IDs, what gene symbol they map to. Um, so do people want me to go through the rest of these or should we move on? Thumbs up if we move on. All right, thumbs up. Okay. So the TXDB packages contain the positional information and you can figure out what's in that T TXDB package by the name. So it goes TXDB, which whatever, and then it's species, source, build, and table. So this particular one is Homo sapiens. It comes from UCSC. It's build HG19, which is what we call, G you know, that's what uh, UCSC calls GRCH37, and it's from their known gene table. So it's all of the information for all of the genes based on the GRCH37 build, and the, the main IDs in that are the known gene IDs from UCSC. And you can infer the same thing like this TXDB, it's Drosophila melanogaster, it's from UCSC, it's DM3 build and its ensemble gene. Um, a similar package is these ensemble DB packages that are nicely built by Johan Rainier. And he's got like literally a gajillion of them. These four are actually built packages. The rest of them we have to get from the annotation hub and we'll talk about that a little bit later, Lori will. But it's sort of the same thing. So this ensemble DB, it's um, Redis Norvegicus and it's ensemble version 79. 
um, there's no table because it's just basically from Ensemble. So these transcript packages, you can use select and map IDs like what we did before with those, um, the functional annotation packages. So you can say something like select from this package, these two entry gene IDs. I want the transcript name, the chromosome, the start, the end, and I'm gonna tell you that these are gene IDs. And then it'll spit out what you expect. You know, there's for each one of those, there's two transcripts. Like for the first gene, there's two transcripts. They're both on chromosome 19. They have slightly different starts and stops. Um, and then we can do the same thing with the ensemble DB one and say, give me the gene ID, the gene name, the sequence name, the sequence start, the gene sequence end. And we're using on gene IDs and it'll do sort of the same thing. It's chromosome one, here's the ensemble gene, here's the gene name. Um, I mean, it's on target gene ID, it's on chromosome 19, and here's where they start and end. But that's not normally how one would use them. In general, with this position data, you would use something called a genomic ranges or G ranges. And we're just going to cover this in just really quick because it's useful in the same way that the annotation is useful for an, uh, an expression set, but this is for a different sort of a similar pack, a similar object, but for more like RNA-seq type data. So if you use this genes accessor, it'll basically say, give me all the genes that are in this thing. And so when you do that, it'll give you this G ranges object where it says, you know, here's the gene ID, it's on chromosome 19, here's where it starts, here's where it stops, it's on the negative strand, and here's the gene ID. And the nice thing about this is if you just type the name of it, it'll just give you the first five and the last five, unlike what R will normally do with some huge thing like this. I mean, this has got 23,000 rows. Normally R would just sit there and spit it out until it got the max print, you know, and you'd be sitting there waiting for a while. Um, you could also do a thing called the G ranges list, where if you say, I want the transcripts and this, um, I want transcripts by something. And what the default for this is, is by gene. So I want all the transcripts for each gene from this thing. And it spits out a thing that's a set, it's, it's a list of these little G ranges for each transcript. So gene one has got two transcripts, which is what we saw up here, right? So when we, when we did this select thing, we saw there's two transcripts, right? Um, and when we do this transcripts by, we get the same thing. There's two transcripts for that gene number one. Here's where they start, here's where they stop, and here's the transcript name. Um, for um, gene ID 10, there's just one transcript, and here's where here's the chromosome, here's where it starts and stops. Um, you can get lots of things out of these um, objects. You can get transcripts, genes, coding sequences, promoters, all the exons. You can also get it grouped by a second element. So like that first thing I showed was transcript by, we can get all the transcripts and we can group them by something like gene. Um, you can get exons, you can get exons and group them by transcript or all the exons and group them by gene, which is, these are all really nice things. We're not gonna get into it too deep because that's a whole nother workshop going through these things. But why we want those is really nice. And the reason for that is these ranges objects allow us to subset things based on positional information. So we can do this thing where we do use this over function where we take those transcripts and we say, we just want the transcripts that overlap those first two genes. And you'll get what you expected, which is gene one and gene two, but we also get this other one. So there's a third um, transcript that overlaps that's from this other gene that overlaps this first gene. So this is just position. We said on this chunk of the genome, we want everything that is all of the genes that are in that region. And the reason we want to be able to do that is because we can, we can do the sort of mapping from one thing to another. So if you did something like a methylation study and you get all these differentially methylated regions, and then you have RNA-seq data and you say, well, I know these are the regions on the genome that are differentially methylated, now I want to be able to find all the genes that are in that region and see if they're differentially expressed. This allows you to really easily take something like a summarized experiment object, which is very similar to that expression set object, only this annotation data 
that column is now a G range is that gives the positional information. So you can say, I only care about certain regions of the gene and I want to subset this thing just based on that. And so you can subset this summar summarization, summarized experiment object just by that positional information and everything still ends up lined up just the way you wanted it to be. So it ends it up ends up really nice because then you can subset one set of data based on data from another one, just based on this genomic position. Um, so I know that was pretty fast, but uh, hopefully it wasn't too fast. So here's some TXDB exercises we can try. So how many transcripts does PPR gamma have according to UCSC? Now, if you think about that, this is sort of a two-step process, right? So the UCSC um, database, if we ask for the transcripts, it's going to spit those out based on, if we do transcripts by, it's going to spit out those transcripts based on the gene ID. We already showed earlier how to map PPR gamma to the gene ID. So we already know what the what PPR gamma's gene ID, which is, uh, didn't we do that? Yeah. Oh, no, we did the ensemble ID. So let's do that. So the on-train gene ID for PPR gamma is 5468. So now if you do transcripts by on that TXDB object, it'll give you this list that's got the name of that list is the entree gene ID. So then you can subset that entree gene ID, that, that G ranges list based on that ID, right? So if we do uh, I had to load the package. So now we know what that ID is. So if we do and then we subset using the dollar sign, we can put in um, 5468. So this is all of the transcripts according to UCSE for PPR gamma. Now here's the trick. So one of my things that I'm always banging on about on the, on the support site is the fact that it's difficult to map between Ensemble and NCBI. And here's a reason. So does Ensemble agree on that? Right, so we have, if we load, load this ensemble DB package, and then we do um, And so we already looked up here, we figured out what PPR gamma is, what is the other ensemble ID, is this. So, 
we found TXDB, the UCSE thinks there's 10 transcripts for PPR gamma. Ensemble thinks there's 14 transcripts for that same exact gene. So if you wanted to do this thing where you're mapping these gene IDs back and forth, you start having problems because one group says, this is how many transcripts there are. And another group says, yeah, no, there's, there's not that many, there's, there's less. And so then you end up having this intractable problem where you're trying to say, well, what gene ID maps from this gene to that gene on these different annotations and it's you have this apples and oranges pro problem where it's hard to do that mapping um so james i know that um that that always gets to be this this big challenge because like for instance if you're running like de seq2 it um well, just things nat a lot of things naturally are, are labeled with ensemble IDs because people right. think that's a very stable gene ID. But then right. you're trying to go back and get a lot of stuff out of NCBI that maps to that. And right. uh, and so these these annotation packages become useful for kind of creating that cross between I can get the entree ID based on the ensemble ID, but then so so is the solution just to stick with to just to just only stay in one side of the aisle or that is that's my um that's what i argue that you should do and the reason i argue that is because so i don't know if you're familiar with the main um program uh, the main project so there's a project between ensemble and ncbi that they started back in 2018 where they're trying to find one single transcript between every single human gene that they can agree on. And they're like, I don't know, 70 or 80% of the way through. After like four years, they're only 70% of the way through all the transcripts just to find one that matches. So it's sort of this intractable problem and it's, the, it's going both ways that's really hard. So if you have ensemble IDs and you go to NCBI, when we build the annotation packages, we, basically query one of those annotation groups and say, well, what entree gene IDs, what NCBI IDs do you think map to your ensemble IDs? And they say, well, these ones do. If you go and you ask NCBI and say, what of your IDs map to the ensemble IDs, they don't give you the same list. So it depends on which direction you're going. And it depends on which person you're asking, you know, does you know, entry gene ID or does uh, ensemble ID map to this? It depends on who you're asking. And so there's a lot of complexity to this whole, what's a gene and where are they and what transcripts are there and what's the UTR? And there's different ways of defining that. And these two groups define things slightly differently. And so they get slightly different results. And so because of that, it's easier if you just don't ever try to do it, which is basically what I do. I don't, I try not to, to map between them. And sometimes you have to, but usually it's, it's safer if you don't. So if you've got ensemble IDs, it's better to get things from Biomart. And if you've got NCB, if you've got NCBI gene IDs, it's better to get it from UCSC and the, the bioconductor transcript packages. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I'm thinking similarly for the for the reference uh, genome also because I noticed that like, um, you know, for the for the the TXDB it's for HG19, um, but if you're if you're if you're using HG38, um, then is there is there an equivalent uh, an equivalent TXDB? Yeah. Yes. Um, so <laughs> here's where it gets a little bit trickier. So we we get these data from UCSC. And UCSC up until HG19 always used their own IDs. So when I showed um, this right here, see these transcript IDs? Those are their own transcript IDs. They just made those up. Um, starting with HG38 they started using ensembles transcript IDs. 
So now they're already internally doing this mapping between Ensemble and NCBI. And so it's my contention that we should have one set of data that's purely NCBI and one set of data. So Johan Renier has Ensemble DB packages for every single release of Ensemble. So you can get 101, 100, 103. I mean, there's, there's a gajillion of them. And so if you want to do all those mappings in your in Ensemble, you should probably stick with Ensemble, but UCSC has made it problematic because their TXDB that we get from them is partially based on Ensemble. Yeah, in the in the chat, I don't know if you can see, but uh, Jenny Dernovich from uh, from University of Illinois, she says she agrees with you 100% and thinks that bioconductors should move away from UCSC completely. Yeah, um, I see. I see the point. I don't know if I agree one hundred percent with it. Let's see. Her someone's raising their hand here. We'll 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 bring her on stage. <clears throat> <laughs> hey, Jenny. <laughs> Hi, Jim. <laughs> yeah, we we've had this conversation many many times. Um, so personally, bioinformatically, any of the files that people used to get from UCSC, there's there's no point in using them. Like you have to manually go and click on their browser, or whatever, to download a GTF file. And so we stopped even thinking about using UCSC resources for their their genomes or their GTF files like eight years ago. Right. And I don't know if anybody else uses UCSC anymore actually as their files that they're using for their alignments and their gene models and stuff. So I, I, I would strongly argue, at, at, and again, Ensemble's one and NCBI, it would be a pain to have to duplicate both of those for all the stuff, but people are using those. I don't know anybody who still uses UCSC as their actual resource. Right, well, fair enough. So that's, there's a difference there too, right? So there's mm -hmm. NCBI, which does the annotation and UCSC has this database that they use to provide the annotation where they've added their secret sauce to it, mm. right? So that's one extra layer of complexity that makes it even more problematic. So yeah, annotation is by, you know, it, and it's changing every day. It changes next week. It changes ensemble changes. There's every three months. It's, it's a constantly moving target and it's never going to match up. Right. I agree. It, yeah. So there is no correct answer. There is no best solution. Um, but I actually am surprised that Bioconductor is still using UCSC as their primary data source for these because we we determined about eight to 10 years ago that their, and their actual data files that you would use to do an alignment or whatever just we're not as good as going directly to NCBI or Ensemble. Right. Fair enough. Um, so I'm going to blast through this really quick because I'm taking all of Lori's time. The one last thing I want to talk about is a new package that we just developed called the orthology.dv package. And this is for sort of an edge case where you need to map between species. So as an example, you can use select and the orthology G and you can just use like the keys from the, the human and map them to Danny or Rario. So basically what we're saying is I have all these um, human entry gene IDs and I want all the zebrafish versions. And so it'll then give you this data frame where it says this is the ID for human and this is the corresponding one and this is all through NCBI, this is their mapping. So it's nice if you are doing any of this cross species mapping and there's like 368 species in here so you can get like all the key types and the, they're all the different species. Um, and so if you need to do that sort of thing, this is available. Um, so. I'm going to apologize to Lori for hogging up all of her time. And 
Sean can you switch us and <laughs> do her part? I'd rather uh, things get done in detail and you do a fantastic explanation, so no worries, because the online stuff goes quick. Uh, before we switch over, though, are there any other last minute questions for James' stuff so uh, far? There's there's one question. Um, it, maybe he can touch on it briefly. Uh, how could UCSC improve their resources to work with Bioconductor? I interviewed with them recently, and they are very Python-centric. It's not really an issue of them improving their resources to work with BioC. So the the way we get the data from them is we they have a a MySQL database that you can actually query directly, and so we get the data easily from them. So that's not the issue. It's not a problem of getting the data. The problem is more like what Jenny is saying, where they make decisions about what they're going to provide. And sometimes those decisions don't make sense. Like what I was saying with the known gene table now being based on ensemble gene IDs when it's all in CBI mappings. So I've argued for years that you shouldn't even try to do this mapping. And here they're just doing it under the hood. So um, there is a function where you can make your own transcript database called uh, make TXDB from um, GTF, so you can get your own GTF from um, NCBI and do what Lori was saying, which you could just, I mean, what Jenny was saying, where you can just make your own transcript database based on a GTF that you just got from NCBI and you know exactly what it is. And so maybe that's what we should be providing going forward. I think that's maybe a valid argument. Great. There's... Um... There was another question, but I think for time, if Andrew, if you'd be okay, we'll hold on to it till later so we can let Lori move on. Okay. <laughs> Lone thumbs up. Go ahead, Lori. You got mute, Lori. That would help. Can you see my R Studio screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so, as Jim nicely explained, so there's these OrgDB and TextDB packages, and the OrgDB packages contain a lot of um, functional annotation and aliases, where our TextDB packages have all this positional information. So, it'd be really nice if everything was combined in one spot. Um, and that's where these organism DB packages come in. So there's a Homo sapien one. And if we load the library um, and pull up the object, you can see that it kind of is a cross of uh, the text DB, the org DB, um, and the go DB. So it does have ontology information as well. And the nice part about these organism DB packages um, is again, you get all of the functionality from the OrgDB and TextDB packages. So those gene functions that um, Jim showed earlier, the promoter functions, um, all of those functions are available to use on this organism DB object. Um, and while it's provided with a certain TXDB and OrgDB, uh, you can change it out. So if you wanted to change it out for a more recent build or a different build, you could swap out your TXDB object. Um, but just as uh, the proof of principle here, as mentioned before, we saw that genes function that we used. So we could use that same genes function and get... Um, if we specified what columns we wanted, we could automatically put into a select and get all of the metadata information without having to go across the two different objects. So all of it is in one place to query altogether. Um, and in the interest of giving you guys more questions and getting to the end, uh, so, 
I'll work through some of these exercises. Hopefully you could think about how you would have done them, but it's really similar to before where um, if we're looking for the go term for BRCA1, uh, we can do a select on our, uh, on our object for say BRCA1 and we can search for go and we gave it a symbol and that query works. Um, so similarly, if we were looking at something like you would have done on a TXDB object and mapping back and forth to um, what gene does the USC transcript map to, so again, we have all of that TextDB information here, so we could do a select on, on our main object. We can put in our transcript of question. And we were looking for a symbol in this case for what gene and we were giving it the TX name. Um, so just little proof of principles that all of those functions work. Um, so <clears throat> the one drawback of organism DB packages, and I'm not sure if I open, do you see the new tab that I just opened? Yes. Perfect. Um, so hopefully you guys are familiar with the bioconductor page and there's the annotation data here that we've all been talking about. And when you look at package types, you can see that there's the chip DBs and the org DBs that we talk about. And if we look at organism DB, there are only three such packages that exist for human, mouse, and rat. So if you were looking for a non-standard organism, this type of package wouldn't work and it wouldn't be available. So that's kind of the drawback of the organism DB packages. So the nice part is this secondary package called organism dplyr. And organism dplyr um, tries to be similar in function where it will combine data from a txdb and an orgdb object. And, um, and then again, similarly, you would have all the same functionality that you would using those individual orgdb or TXDB packages. Uh, there is a useful example in the package called HG38 Lite so that we can get a light example that loads rather quickly. Um, the main function of organism dplyr is this um, SRC organism where you guys are familiar with the, uh, the help that just switched over here. Hopefully I can find the vignette again. But this is the main function for um, for organism dplyr, you can get more information um, on the main functions, but its main argument is you give it a txdb package for it to do the mapping to. Can I go back? Ah, perfect. Um, and then again, uh, we have all the same functionality, so we can get the promoters, we could get the genes. I did promoters here, I think just as something different than, than genes, but, um, and it gives it into that same similar G range object that then you could use. Uh, if we look at that main object, there are a lot of different tables that provide the mappings between everything. You can kind of get an idea from the names of the tables where the information came from. So anything with the range in front of it probably came from your text DB. So you have the CDs, the exons, the genes, um, and the TX names from the Go packages, you'll have Go IDs so that you can get um, ontology information. And then uh, as shown here, a bunch of different IDs so you can cross back and forth between a few different IDs and get aliases and uh, gene symbols and mappings. And it makes it really easy to do complex queries looking for um, information from 
functional and positional information. So just as a case here, using our dplyr functionality and pipes, if we did this sort of kind of complex query where maybe we were looking for the genomic position information for perhaps these two gene symbols, ADA and AT2, um, we could do an inner join on the IDs and the range for the genes table, and then filter for those genes. And then we're gonna select what columns we want to actually, so this select is different from the select that we are using. This is the dplyr select, so that we can display what kind of column information that we wanted. So we wanna display the columns for chromosome, start and stop location, and mapping back and forth. Um, so thinking about some of the dplyr exercises, if we went to that help page again, there is a function, if I get the, called supported organisms, that gives you all of the organisms that are supported currently by organism dplyr, um, that you could put in the related txdb and use this functionality. Um, so, it looks like there are 21 supported organisms. So that might be a good uh, first location. Um, I'm going to skip these examples for now. We've done a lot of selects. They're basically the same concept as we have been doing. Um, I encourage you to go through these examples. And if you have issues using the organism dplyr interface, you can um, by all means, send me a Slack message or find me at a table somewhere to, to get more information on how to use it or if there's a bug somewhere. Another type of bioconductor package that uh, can be useful and something that's not necessarily annotation but closely related is the sequence information. So BS genome packages are um, the type of package that you would use to get sequence information. And um, there are a lot of available genomes, I believe. Um, so I think we can do, so 104 that are currently in use and available right now. Um, so these types of packages uh, you would use, again, to get sequence information. So if we load one of those and the underlying object, the main function for BS genome packages is this get seek function. So uh, we can look at get seek. And it's nice because, ooh, why did that autocorrect there? Well. You can pass in, in the get seek, you could uh, do a specific chromosome if you were interested in the chromosome, or you can send in a genomic range object or a genomic range list, um, or sorry, a G ranges list object, so that um, you can get specific genomic sequences for parts of genes. So this GNS we created earlier by doing uh, the genes function. So just to kind of reacquaint you with that object, it's a G range object. Um, so I plain out a section of that G ranges, the gene object to get uh, the, to get five, four, six, seven. And if we stick that into the get seek across the homo sapiens, we would get the actual sequence information for that section of the gene. Um, any questions so far on that? You know, we only have about nine minutes left, so I want to touch briefly on the uh, the online resources. But no questions so far. Awesome. So two online resources that we have for getting annotation data is the Annotation Hub and uh, Biomart. So Annotation Hub, uh, I am very well acquainted with. I'm one of the persons that maintain it. We rely on, um, oh, um, users to contribute to the Annotation Hub. Um, so it's a user contributed resource. The Bioconductor will 
core will produce some resources in the annotation hub automatically. Uh, when there's an ensemble release, we'll put in ensemble resources where you can get uh, G ranges of ensemble resources um, and uh, or DBs at release time go into annotation hub. But other than that, we heavily rely on people submitting to the annotation hub. So we really encourage people to, um, to submit um, the idea is, is that these annotation objects um, are living on a server somewhere, so we'll pull directly from Ensemble or we'll pull from an AWS bucket um, the data that a user will request. So it's not in existing inside a package anywhere, and sometimes it's direct server access, and sometimes it's to a package that then gets processed. Currently, there are almost 60,000 records in the Annotation Hub that are available for download. Um, so lots of different types of resources. Um, and the biggest thing about using the Annotation Hub is a query function. So as shown here, you can do an M columns on the Hub, and that shows M, col M calls for metadata. So different metadata columns that are accessible calls that you can form different queries against. Um, so for instance, we have a data provider. So where does the data come from? Does it come from USC? Does it come from Ensemble, RefNet, um, KEG information? So you would be able to filter based on a data provider that you want. Um, there's a class for our data class. So maybe you're very familiar working with a particular type of bioconductor class, like a G-range object or a string set object uh, for like string sets. So you could filter based on um, the type of object that you use uh, classically, a species or a taxonomy ID. So you could search for uh, those. Uh, source type. So did the source type come from a FASFA file, a GTF file? Uh, maybe certain types are better than others. So as an example query here, we can query our hub and say, we really like working with G ranges and we're working with humans and we like ensemble. We can put together that query and it will give us another hub object, but a pared down hub object from the 60,000 to 100 records. Um, so as mentioned, we do per release. So um, you can see all the different, uh, we put in Ensemble 104. So these are all relating to the recent 104 release. Um, so maybe to get information on a particular resource, there's a single bracket method. So say I wanted to investigate more what this resource is before I actually downloaded it and really looked at the metadata, I can do a single bracket on a method and it will bring up all of that information um, available on that particular resource. And then to download it, um, I'll do the one that's in here. I haven't updated this for the release recent release, um, but uh, when I do a double square bracket method, it will actually download it to your local file system for use and, um, and manipulation. So, sorry, it's taking a second to download. Um, any questions while it's finishing the download? Does it download it as an R object or as the native file? So like for instance, if it's a GTF, is it downloading it as a G ranges or is it downloading as a GTF? Um, depends on the resource and um, how it was set up in the hub. Generally for the GTFs, um, they're gonna be loaded directly into R. Um, the ones that we provide by default will convert it into a G ranges on the fly. So you'll get back that um, R um, G ranges object. But there are other re uh, resources in the cache that will actually download a hard file that then will get loaded into R and manipulated appropriately. So it really depends on the resource. So um, if we look at what I want, um, it's that converted GTF um, into a G range object that then we can use um, 
as James was talking earlier about creating your own TXDB object. So if you really like to, uh, working with those TXDBs and now we have this G-range object, there's a make TXDB from G-ranges where we can put that G-ranges object into the function and then get back a TXDB object that we can use and then do the similar queries and searching and filtering that we've been doing along the entire uh, demo. Um, this is taking a little bit, so I might try to... Um, so just for the annotation hub exercises, just as kind of proof of principle, so um, how many resources are there in the annotation hub? For, uh, for Salmon. So to do something like that, you would set up your query and just query against the hub for your species of interest. So uh, make sure I spell it right. Ooh. And we can see that there's currently 46 records that would um, possibly match that search criteria. Um, and again, this is another one where possibly making the TXDB object from a query. I encourage you to work through it, and if you have questions or concerns, to let me know. Um, the other resource, I know I'm really short on time here because two minutes, but um, Biomart. Um, so Biomart links to the Ensemble browsers, um, Ensemble Biomart server. Um, Mike Smith has done a lot of work the last couple of years to try to make it a little bit more stable and um, use some caching mechanisms to try to speed it up. Um, the main function, um, or the the main idea uh, is that you have these different marts, so you can choose which mart to use, um, and then. You can list the different data sets that are available within a MART. Um, and once you decide which particular um, data set that you're of interest, you can perform different mappings and queries and filter information based on um, BioMART. Um, so I'm sorry that wasn't a huge explanation since we're at time, but um, again, I'll be around. And so if anyone has questions on Biomart, by all means, please um, Slack me or maybe it can set up a table tomorrow if anyone is interested in running through more of those examples. Well, thank you very much, Lori and Jim. That was fantastic. Um, we're, we're, at, we're at time. Um, I'd be willing to take at least one question if anyone has something that they're dying to know before we before we let them go. Get a move for that. I see people in the session starting to drop off. It's late. I think uh, I think we'll call it good. So, um, if anyone has any any further questions, take Lori up on the offer to find her in the in the in the tables, uh, or I'm sure you can email them as well. This is, this is fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.